Wow, That's the, 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 this, this is what you get for coming in after lunch, right? That, there's, there's like twice as many though as I expected. Um, so first, first things first, uh, I'll go ahead and mention that I'm, I'm pretty sick, like cold and cold or flu or something. So uh, uh, if I make funny sniffling noises or coughing or something like that, just please, please ignore me. And uh, when it comes time to the, uh, for any questions, if there are any, uh, if I can have somebody uh, up close, yeah, maybe Lewis, you know, you yell them back at me because my ears are all plugged up. Um, and then I'm also on like a lot of uh, strange combination of over-the-counter medication. So if I do something bizarre or get naked or something, Lewis, maybe again, you can come up and stop me. Um, so uh, my name is Eric Evans. I have, uh, I'm on the Cassandra PMC and uh, have been involved with Cassandra since pretty much the time it went into the incubator, uh, first for Rackspace and more recently for Akunu. Uh, and myself and a, and a co-worker at Akunu are the ones that uh, implemented virtual nodes, so I, I thought I'd make the rounds and kind of explain it. It's, it's a topic that a lot of people are, are interested in. Um, to kind of understand the motivation for doing this and, uh, and the what's and the why's, it helps to review the, uh, you know, how content-based distribution in Cassandra works. Um, so I think there's probably some overlap here between some of the earlier presentations, uh, but in case you weren't here for that or just to have it on top of your mind, I'll go over it again. Uh, so the way this works is, you know, we take the, the, the namespace that all of our keys will, will exist in, if you think of it as, a, as the primary key, that's pretty, pretty close. Um, we take the namespace that will cover all possible keys, and we order them in ascending order, um, and we kind of visualize this as a ring or you can think of it as a clock face uh, where the lowest value starts, you know, uh, and works clockwise to higher and higher values until it, you know, rolls over again at the, at the minimum value. And then we position our nodes, the nodes in our cluster, uh, around this ring or clock face. Um, and the partitions, the data that, that gets stored on each node is that intervening space between, you know, where the node rests on the ring and the, the node before it. Uh, and this works pretty well because all you really need to do is find where your key sorts in that namespace and you found the node to store it on and likewise uh, to go back and make subsequent reads. And since it is a distributed system, uh, you know, we're going to store uh, redundant copies uh, for fault tolerance and we just need something deterministic based on that first location. So um, once these are all on the, on the you know, laid out on the cluster, no copy is more important than the other. There's no notion of primary and secondary or primary and backup copies. Uh, but for purposes of positioning, you know, placing them in, in the cluster, this first node is the partitioning and everything else is based upon that. So the most obvious, you know, simple, and this is, this is uh, implemented in Cassandra as the simple strategy, is to take the next n minus one nodes around the ring. Uh, in this case, we have a replication factor of three, so we position the one on node A, and then the next two copies of that data go on B and C. Uh, something else that may be a little bit worn out, but it, it's, it's uh, you know, bears repeating for this, for this topic, uh, is the cap theorem. So this is, a, this is sort of a device we use to explain the contentious properties of a distributed storage system. So the, the C stands for consistency, and you know, once we have multiple copies of data in, in a cluster, we have the, the possibility for them to be inconsistent with one another. Uh, the you know, A stands for availability. Uh, now that we have multiple copies in the system, we have the ability to survive a node failure, uh, to you know, write from or read to another copy. And partition tolerance just means you know, if some portion of this cluster uh, becomes unavailable from another, uh, you know, being tolerant of that partition would mean that, you know, we can continue reading and writing from these disjoint sections of the cluster and that that would be okay. Um, and the easiest way to think about why these are contentious is if you imagine, you know, a simple sort of master-master uh, replication between a couple of machines, um, you know that uh, in order to make sure that's consistent, you would want that write to succeed on both nodes before you, you know, before you considered that a successful transaction. Uh, that's how you would maintain, maintain consistency in a very simple uh, situation like that. But obviously, if, if, that's the, you know, if that's the conditions by which you make a successful write, then if one node is down, um, you, you've lost availability. So this, this, is why, this is why we describe these as being contentious. Usually someone will say, uh, 
pick two, you know, to say that at any given instance in time, you can only have guarantees on two of these properties. But uh, what we do in Cassandra is we, we have what was called tunable consistency. And if you've read the, uh, the white paper on Dynamo, this is very similar to what they, what they do there as well. So assuming we have three copies, we can decide on a per operation basis uh, how much of that replication should be synchronous or asynchronous to let you trade off between consistency and availability. Uh, so if you imagine a write happening at consistency level one, um, and we're assuming that the, the replication for these other two copies is going to happen asynchronously, uh, when the client hangs up, we have no guarantees that that, that, that data is consistent uh, between all three copies. But if, for example, we were able to do the, the corresponding read uh, at consistency level all and read from all of the copies, there's no way where we're not going to get that most recent value, uh, you know, assuming that there was an inconsistency. Uh, so we let you trade off. Uh, in this case, we're saying, you know, we want maximum availability during the write, uh, and we want consistency at the expense of availability on the read. Uh, so a more common scenario is we'll do something like quorum reads and writes. And quorum just means, you know, a simple majority of the nodes. So using the same example of a replication factor of three, uh, we could do a, a write at quorum, which would be two nodes. Um, and then, you know, we have no guarantees on that third, third copy. Uh, but if we did the write likewise at quorum, uh, there's no way we're not going to, you know, encounter the most recent value, even if there's some inconsistency. So this, this gives you read your write consistency. Uh, there may be an inconsistency between there, but you're always going to read your write, which is what people really count, count on, uh, care about. And so the important property here is that, you know, so long as the number of reads you're blocking on or the number of reads uh, that you're, you're doing uh, uh, synchronously, together with the number of writes you're doing synchronously, synchronously, so long as that is greater than your replication count, you'll have that read your write consistency. So that's, that's basically in a nutshell how, how, how the, the, the content uh, distribution works in Cassandra, or uh, you know, what I referred to on the first slide as a distributed hash table. Um, and it seems pretty elegant, it seems pretty, you know, pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and produces you know, like a, uh, really good results. Uh, but it's not without, you know, like its share of problems. It's a little bit too naive uh, is the problem. And so I'll explain why that is. So the first, the first example of this is that the, the distribution of load, of request load, is, is not good uh, with, this, with this algorithm. Um, and if we go back and look at the example of replication count of, of three, you know, uh, for, for the partition identified by A uh, with the replicas being stored on B and C, uh, that's true for all of the nodes in the cluster. So in this case, uh, the redundant copies for, Z, for partition Z are also stored on A and B. And likewise, um, Y are being stored on Z and A. So we've got A is sharing, is, you know, it's participating in three replica sets. It's Y, Z, A, Z, A, B, and A, B, C is, are all, all share A in common, node A in common. So if you can imagine a situation where we lose one node, it's just completely failed for some reason, and it's not part of that quorum or part of that consistency level we can choose from. Um, and it's pretty obvious to imagine that this is going to impose more load on the neighboring nodes, because there's, there's this locality property where uh, the nodes around A, uh, however many depending on the, on the replication factor, um, share in these replica sets. So if we're doing that, consist that uh, quorum read and write like I described before, Instead of having three nodes available to do synchronous replication on two, now we're doing them all on, on just two because there's, there's, uh, there's a failure. So the way you would deal with a failure, obviously, is you would replace that node or bring it back up. Um, and of course, you know, any, any writes that occurred in the, in the meantime need to be synchronized back over. We need to get the consistency back up for that, for that failed node. Uh, and that involves streaming the, you know, from the redundant copies on Y, Z, and B, and C. And uh, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take much to figure out that that's going to impose even more load on, the, on those nodes. Uh, probably at the time when we, need to, when we need to get load off of those nodes, they're already incurring a heavy, heavier than usual request load. Uh, you know, now we impose even more load on them in order to bring A back up to date with the, with the rest of the cluster. 
so another example um, is the, the distribution of the data. So that was a distribution of load or request load. I'll talk about the distribution of data. So assuming you have a cluster of, say, four nodes, uh, you know, nice even, even partitions, which incidentally, this is, this, the, the onerous is on you to do this. You would have to calculate four tokens uh, that would position them this evenly. Uh, you know, the cluster grows and you need to, you need to increase capacity. Uh, you bootstrap a new node in. Uh, but the very best you can do is bisect one of the existing partitions. Uh, there's, I mean, there's nothing else to do. Um, but that creates an imbalance. You know, now we have you know, some, some smaller partitions and some larger ones, and the, the larger ones aren't receiving any you know, relief from this. So we're left to move the locations of those existing four nodes around the ring. And of course, that move of the, of the partition means recalculating and moving data uh, along with it. And uh, so that's not at all optimal. We would, we would want to just move the data necessary to accomplish this, this add. Uh, and so that's not a very good, a very good way of, of expanding your cluster. Um, and we know this. And so we usually tell you, especially when your clusters are small and that, that imbalance would be large, uh, we say double the size of your cluster. And if you've been around Cassandra, you probably heard someone say that. You know, if you have a small number of nodes and you're going to expand it for the first time, double the size of the cluster. Uh, and this is so that you could then bisect each range and not have to move, uh, move any. But that's, a, that's also a pretty, pretty poor th thing to have to do. Um, and we've probably gotten a little too comfortable at telling people to do that. Uh, and so that's not good either. So uh, the, top, the, the topic of this talk is virtual nodes. So it probably doesn't take much to, to guess that, uh, oops, that the solution to this is uh, virtual nodes. And so in a nutshell, what virtual nodes is, is we're just going to break that one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between a host and a token. We're still going to divide the ring into, you know, into some number of partitions, but it'll be more than the number of nodes we have. And then we're going to you know, randomly distribute these partitions to, to, the, to the nodes we have so that each node has more than one and that they're not you know, contiguous. Uh, and so the benefits of this is that it's, it's operationally simpler. Uh, we don't have to worry about moving, uh, moving our nodes around the ring if we're adding a new one because uh, a new joining node can take an equal number of partitions from the existing nodes in the cluster, uh, which, which is also results in better distribution of the load, of the load and the data. Um, and because you know, it's now, you know, we're now sharing these ranges uh, with, with all of the other nodes in the cluster, you know, we can take advantage of concurrency instead of streaming from just the localized neighbors. We can stream from all of the nodes in the cluster. And this gives us smaller partitions. Uh, you know, if you have a four node cluster, conventionally with Cassandra, you have four partitions, you know, uh, we can now make, make much more, you know, uh, a much larger number of overall, overall partitions that makes them smaller. Um, and, you know, if, if they fail, for example, fail to stream, Midway through, we don't have to retry you know, a, a great big partition. We can do this more incrementally. Um, and it also provides a way of supporting heterogeneous hardware because now not every node has to have the same uh, percentage of data. So there's a number of different strategies you could take for, uh, for, for, for implementing virtual nodes. But I think they can all kind of be broken down into these three basic categor categories. You'd have uh, automatic sharding, fixed partition assignment, and random token assignment. So by automatic sharding, I'm saying uh, kind of like way, way Bigtable does or Mongo's auto sharding, if you're familiar with that, is you know, we have a, a threshold on the size of the partition. And when the partition exceeds that threshold, then we split it. And newly created partitions can be moved to uh, nodes that have less data or you know, are lower, lowerly lo lower loaded. The uh, fixed partition assignment is where you would take uh, you know, a fixed number of toke or a fixed number of partitions for the for the entire key space. Uh, you know, you just start out with some number of partitions cluster wide. We call that Q. Uh, so then the the number of partitions per node would be Q over n, where n is the number of nodes. Um, and then if you add a new node, uh, that new new node just simply gets some of the existing partitions uh, from the other nodes in the cluster. This is, if you're familiar with the Dynamo paper, this is what they refer to as strategy three, what they, what they eventually arrived at. They tried three different approaches, and this is the one they finally went with. 
Uh, so it's also likewise the way uh, Voldemort does it. And finally, we have the, the, the random token assignment works by uh, giving each node in the cluster a fixed number of tokens. So we'll call that T, T tokens. And these are randomly calculated. So we just randomly generate tokens, uh, partition identifiers, if you will, from within that you know, namespace. Uh, we talked about earlier, you know, having hash namespace, you know, murmur three or maybe MD5. So this might be, you know, just randomly generated 128-bit values. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, every new joining node simply generates another, you know, T random tokens, and those will inevitably, you know, cut into some existing part, you know, key space that's held by the other nodes. Uh, and then, if you're familiar with libkatama, this is kind of how it does it. And if you generalize Cassandra's, you know, legacy system as, you know, where, the, where t equals one, this is basically how we've been doing it all along. Um, and among these strategies, the things to consider, the important aspects are, uh, you know, what is the number of partitions that this results in? What is the size of the partitions? And then, you know, how do these two properties change as we, as we grow the cluster, as we add more nodes or we add more, more data? Um, and in summary, this is kind of how they kind of how that shakes out. Um, I won't go over this, this whole sl slide because I'm going to explain all these in depth, but if, you know, for future reference, these are, this is, this is how each of those things uh, balances out. So with automatic sharding, the partition size is, is constant because uh, we, have a, we have a threshold and we'll never grow beyond that threshold. Uh, maybe constant's not the right word, but uh, at, they're at most some size. And that's good. Having a nice predictable size of the partition is a good property. Uh, but that means that the number of partitions scales with the size of the data set. So, you know, as we add more and more data, uh, you know, we, we, result, we, we create a, you know, linearly that results in uh, an increase in partitions, the number of partitions. Um, and that's not good. You know, if we're kind of aiming for, you know, infinite scalability, uh, which is maybe hubris, but that, you know, we're kind of trying not to have an obvious bottleneck, um, then you know, you don't want the number of partitions to grow with the amount of data, you know, simply by the amount of data we add. Um, so that fixed partition assignment, this is the one where we create Q tokens for the whole cluster up front, and then how many, to uh, how many of these tokens each node has is a function of how many nodes, it's just Q over N. Um, this means that the number of partitions is constant, which is also good. Uh, but it means that the, the, the size of the partition scales with the amount of, linearly with the amount of data we have. So uh, that just, you know, again, that should kind of make sense. You know, we add more nodes, uh, the partitions still continue to grow. Um, and that's not good. Um, and this method also has, uh, you know, higher operational complexity because we have to sort of balance that, you know, token size and number of, of tokens when we create the cluster. We have, to, you know, that's these Q, Q tokens we create, we create up front, and uh, there's kind of no going back from that. Um, and so that's, that's probably the wrong, that's probably the point in time when you're least familiar with, with what you're going to need is when you set it up initially. So finally, that leaves us with, uh, with the random token assignment. This is the one where we, we calculate T random tokens for each node, T new, T new random tokens for each joining node after that. Um, and this means that the number of partitions that we have scales linearly with the number of hosts, which is, it's not good, but it's, it's okay. It's better than, better than uh, scaling with the size of the data. Um, and it means that the partitions themselves will grow as more data is added, but they'll decrease as we add more hosts. And, that, and that's a good property to, to have. So um, all in all, that's really the right balance for Cassandra is this random token assignment. And uh, that's, that's what we've implemented. So on a little more of a practical note, how many people here actually use Cassandra or have used Cassandra? Okay, so quite a few. Uh, so this would be more or less what you would need to do if you wanted to use this. This is kind of like the more practical uh, side of things. Um, initial token is still respected. So uh, you can add uh, your, your tokens manually, uh, comma delimited if you, if you want to. Uh, this file is going to be pretty hard to manage with 256, 128 bit, you know, 256 being the default value of T that we use in, in Cassandra, uh, you know, to separate 256, 128 bit tokens. I mean, we've, we've made you t calculate tokens in the past, so that would be even mo more of a, of a chore now, so I don't recommend doing that. 
Uh, we support it because technically we still have the, the byte ordered partitioner, which you shouldn't be using, but if you did, you would need some way of, of setting these. And uh, probably more important is to make, uh, you know, since we're generating these, these tokens randomly, um, the, the share, the per node share is really ends up balancing out quite closely, but it's not perfect. Uh, so there, there's the use case of, say, for example, benchmarks where you'd want the per node share to be, you know, really, really precise to get good results. Uh, that's, that's an option for that. Uh, more commonly, though, you would just set this number, uh, num tokens to, to 256. That's the default or something else if you know what you're doing. Um, and off you go. Uh, a lot of things, like small things, change with this, with this uh, you know, having multiple tokens per node and having a large number like 256. So we used to treat token almost as like the unique node identifier. I mean, because they were one-to-one, -one, because they were unique. I mean, even an IP address, you could change that. You know, you could change it, renumber your a host. Uh, the token was always kind of the unique way of identifying a node, and so we sort of, you know, displayed it prominently. But uh, this is the, the output of node tool info, and, uh, you know, if you use Cassandra, this is a pretty commonly run command, you know, to kind of get a picture of, you know, a sort of summary view of an, of a, an individual node. But you can imagine trying to display 256 tokens, you know, you just get scroll shock, you know, that's not going to be very useful. Uh, so we suppress that output now, uh, and you, you know, if you have more than one token and uh, we make you throw another switch. Um, another example is node tool ring, which is a, a pretty good, pretty common way of, that people would uh, look at the, the sort of status of the cluster as a whole. Uh, but that's not terribly useful now because it's now expanded by, you know, 255 times the number of nodes you have, and so again, it's scroll shock, and it's not a very good way of just kind of, you know, gathering the summary as a whole. So we've introduced this uh, node tool status command um, to kind of be the replacement of, you know, ring was always meant to show the topology, but it kind of double dutied as like a, a way of looking at the, at the whole cluster. Uh, you'll see that node tool status shows this, this host ID uh, because we don't have, uh, you know, anything unique and singular to a node anymore, we had to create this, this UUID uh, field, and uh, we display that now instead. It'll probably start to become more of a prominent feature. Um, and you can see things like the number of tokens each host has. And, uh, this is probably be the more common all-in-one shot uh, command. Uh, so if you have an existing cluster and you want to migrate it, that's possible. The, the way a migration would work is, you know, let's say you have, you know, three nodes. Uh, you know, you're coming off of Cassandra 1.1 and on to 1.2, the first, first version that supports virtual nodes. Uh, and you want to upgrade. So you would just go into the, the Cassandra.yaml file and you would uncomment that num tokens. Uh, you would set it to something, you know, non, something greater than one. Uh, much like initial token, this is like a one-shot deal. Once you've, uh, you know, entered a value here and restarted it, uh, you can't change it later on, it'll have no effect. Uh, but what that'll do is that'll take your existing partitions and it will split them num tokens way. So, you know, if you've used the default, it'll split each existing range 256 ways. Uh, but it's still 256 partitions that are all contiguous and within the range that you had before. Um, and so there's some value there. Uh, you know, you get that concurrency that, that, you, that, uh, that we promised before. And, uh, you get you know, the smaller, more incremental streaming operations for repairs and bootstraps. And eventually, over time, the placement of those, you know, as you add and remove nodes, will become somewhat randomized. Um, but if you don't want to wait for that, there is a, a new operation called shuffle. And what shuffle does is uh, it just randomizes the placement of those now split ranges. Um, and it's kind of hairy and not very well tested, so if you, do, if you do use Shuffle, make sure this is something that you've tried out in your, uh, uh, you know, your uh, staging environments or development environments first. Um, I don't want to like destroy confidence in it and make everyone run away not wanting to use it, but this is, this is one of those unique, uh, it's filled with all sorts of corner cases and network races, and you know, it's just kind of a hard thing to do, and this is going to be a piece of code that, uh, you know, that, that people who migrate will use exactly once, and anybody who uses a new cluster will never use. Um, so I don't, I don't have a high degree of confidence it will ever be really well tested, so uh, you know, just make sure you test it before you use it. Um, the way it works is, is you know, it's going to calculate a new mapping, 
and it will queue on each ring, on each node the ranges that it should transfer. And each, each node will transfer the ranges to itself. Each, each node is able to steal a, a range. So we calculate which, node, which ranges each node should steal, and we queue them up on, on, a, on a system table. Um, and then we tell it to go, and we give it a few you know, breaks so that uh, you know, one node doesn't get too far ahead of the other. And then if everything goes well, you've completely randomized your placement. Um, but pay attention to the logs and keep an eye on it. Uh, you can always pause it or stop it if it was starting to do something wrong. And, and if it does, it's probably not irrecoverable, uh, hopefully. Uh, this is how that works. There's a, there's a new command called shuffle. And you, know, you can create a new shuffle operation, start and stop it. You can list the moves that are going to be taking place. Um, you can limit it to only to only do a single DC at a time, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's the, the, the performance aspect because you know we, we promise greater performance. So I was throwing a couple of slides here. Uh, you know this is like a 17 node cluster with I think half a billion rows. Um, and this is the remove node operation which would cause you know uh, uh, you know basically all of the data to be moved around the cluster away from a failed node. And a bootstrap, which does the exact opposite of that, you know, adds a new node and streams all of that, all of the data that belongs to it. Um, and the, the, the summary of that is it's, it's a bit more than three times faster. And the reason we show this remove node and bootstrap is because that's kind of the worst case scenario if you had a failed node and you need to get your, you know, your, your fault tolerance back up. Um, that's what that extra concurrency buys you is, is, is the full replacement of a node about, you know, 3.2 times faster, which is pretty good. And uh, that is all I have, other than any questions, if, if anyone has them. Oh, back here. What can you say about compactation level and strategy for a better storage usage? Because we have a problem when we use some kind of compactation. First, it double the size, then it shrink back. So what, what do you recommend for, for the, a better storage usage? Uh, I didn't hear that. Uh, not your fault. I got, my ears are all plugged up. Uh, OK, OK. Did you hear it, Liz? Oh, now, I got it. now I'm going to have him repeat it in a heavy Scottish accent. So L Let me repeat that. Uh, what do you recommend for a compactation uh, strategy? Uh, today I have a problem when we start compacting the, the the SS tables, first it grows the double of the SS tables, then it shrink back to the right size. So what, what kind of compactation are you guys using and what do you recommend? Is that clear? So the question was which compaction strategy? Well, I mean, the, the, the behavior you described sounds like you're talking about the size tiered compaction. Exactly. Which will need uh, you know, the working space equivalent to the size of the files it's compacting in order to be able to, to do that safely atomically. Yes. Um, <coughs> I mean, that's, that's the size tier, size tier compaction is probably the best sort of general use compaction strategy, and that's just a property of that, of that strategy is that, you know, the, the tables that it's compacting, that it, you know, it needs the working space, you know, equal to, the, to them. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, that's something people just usually, you know, they, they, they allow for enough space to make that work. And you, you can use the level compaction strategy, which would be, you know, there would be less, less of that space in use uh, because the tables are more uh, fixed or predictable in size. But the level compaction strategy, you know, it kind of doubles the amount of write I.O. It's, it's designed to sort of amortize the read or the merge por portion of the log structure merge over time and makes writes faster at the expense of of, uh, of write I.O. So, I mean, that's not a necessarily like a trigger I would pull, you know, lean, lightly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So what, what, what issue on the JIRA, Cassandra JIRA covers, or what issues cover the topic for tracking previous correspondence, ongoing correspondence between the development team. Um, and how has the, the conversation gone, particularly for this topic, with the development on Cassandra? Which, which jury issues cover this? Um, I don't know. 
I could look them up for you, but it was, there, was, there was many of them. It wasn't one. It wasn't one. There was probably one master with a bunch of sub-tickets underneath of it, but uh, yeah, it was many. many. There's, a, there was a, there's also a good uh, mailing list. I don't have the link for that handy. A good mailing list thread where we kind of hashed all this out. Might be a better summary than that. I can, I can get that for you. <laughs>